Now my wife Lois wants to share just a little bit about this dynamic of rest and how it's part of the foundation. It was a um, fall rainy weekend about three years ago and we were traveling to uh, further north in the state of Minnesota where we live and um, Jim spoke about this in the church that we were visiting and for some reason it was at this point that that these verses in Genesis 1 and 2 really sunk into my mind and my heart and I realized that God had given us the concept of rest, of work and rest, right at the very beginning of creation. Uh, and that foundation uh, was to solidify all of life. And so it was at this point, about three years ago, that it finally um, sunk into my mind and my heart how very, very important and how foundational um, these verses of Scripture at the very beginning of Scripture were um, for each of us, not just to establish creation and the days of creation, but this beautiful rhythm of life that God has given us and that it is a command. It is a part of the ebb and flow of life to start, to work, and then to cease, and, to, and then to rest. Um, so this was just a part of my pers as part of my personal journey um, that God impressed on my mind. So what is divine rest? Let me read you what Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 um, says. And I think these are some of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So God didn't rest because he was tired. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. He has resources, resources of energy that we know not of. He has full reserves. He, he just never gets tired. So this becomes then a question for us. Why? Does God rest when he doesn't need to? The question must be answered beyond the typical understanding of our use of rest. That is, there must be something besides sleep and rest. Divine rest is beyond sleep or beyond leisure. And that's typically what we think of when it comes to rest. We're either sleeping or we're doing some fun thing that is not part of our work. And both of these in our human existence are very important. But rest for God must be something more than sleep or leisure. And God wants us to enter into a different kind of rest than simply sleeping or escaping from our work through leisure. As we look at these verses in Genesis chapter 2, 1 through 3, uh, rest Divine is what we could call closure. By the seventh day God had rested or finished his, the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. An idea of closure is that we bring an end to a project or a portion of work. Perhaps the project isn't done but we stop and say, well, let's look back at it. Let's take a break from it. In each day of creation, God stopped or paused enough to say, it is good, it is good. And so after a segment of work, we, we close it and acknowledge that so much has been completed. And it's very good to do that. An artist needs to step back from the canvas, which he or she is painting, and look at it 
and take a break from it and get a different view and appreciate what has been completed even though there might, may be much more to do before the painting is uh, finished. So rest divine is, is closure, a time in which we pause and ask questions of ourselves. We gaze upon our work and ask questions like, what does my work mean? And each week we could pause and say, this week I did this and that. What was the meaning of my work? Was it just done because it was commanded or was there something of value to it? For whom did I do this work? We are asked of God to do all things unto him, is to live for an audience of one, more than for our bosses or more than our teachers. Or we're to do all things unto God. Am I doing it for God or for myself or just because I'm told to? How well was my work done? Maybe I need to improve what I do in some fashion or form. And why did I do this in the first place? Well, we ask several questions as we bring closure. What results did I expect and what did I receive? So closure is a time to look upon our work and see the value of it. Closure requires that, we, that a being have the power to stop working. This is very important. We need the ability to stop working. God showed that he had the power not only to create to work, but he could stop. He completed the creation of the world and all its inhabitants by ceasing to produce anything new. It's feasible that God could have just continued to create. I think I'll put another moon to circle the globe, the earth. Maybe I'll make three moons as some other planets have. I enjoy creating so much, I think I'll make more bugs for man to figure out and to swat flies and whatever else. I like all the insects, so I'll keep making them. And he said, I could have said, I am having so much fun as a powerful creator. I never get tired of creating, so I'm just going to keep on making it, making it, making it. And you could say that his ability was controlling him. He was being controlled by his power to create. But instead he said, it's enough. I have power over my work. Now this has serious consequences or a, 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 a workaholic, a person that is obsessed with their work. Maybe that you love your work so much that you don't like to quit. You enjoy what you do and that's great. You found your place where God is having you serve, maybe serving him. And you love people and you, and you want to keep on. But God says, stop. He wants you to have power over your work so you don't do it day after day and wear out because you're not all powerful. You are not God. You will get exhausted. You will get tired. You'll become weary. You'll start making mistakes because you're weary and so forth. He wants you to have power not only to work but to cease to say, stop. Because one of the words, well, the word rest, that is, has a couple of definitions. One is, I should say, the word Sabbath has rest as its definition, but also cease as its definition, as we'll see again and again. Sabbath definitions, rest and cease. You have power to stop your work. God demonstrated that he had power to create as the almighty creator. He also showed that he could stop his work. And that's important for us to consider, as many of us tend to be workaholics. Uh, we're like runaway trains, and we start to work and we can't stop, and we become obsessed with it. Um, so we need to think about setting aside a time to practice closure. Think of a time you might stop during your week and record what you did the last seven days. Simply answer the questions, this week I, and you fill in the blank, what did I do this week? How much did I finish? Maybe I was able to finish a project. Or maybe it's about parenting and you've come to the point where your child is now potty trained. Hooray, you're so glad that that segment of child rearing is over. This child, and maybe you even want to put a monument in your yard to the fact that your child no longer needs your help with all of that part of, uh, of life. Then thank God for those accomplishments, activities, and insights gained. 
So to have a moment for closure is very important every week. Secondly, rest divine is blessing, is blessing. And we find that God blesses what he's made in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. He blessed the seventh day. John Sailhammer again contributes, as soon as living beings are created, the notion of blessing is appropriated because the blessing relates to the giving of life. It's very interesting to note that God doesn't bless simply the earth, the stones, or even the vegetation. God doesn't bless until animals are created. He blesses them, living things that can move and reproduce on their own. He blesses them, and so they do reproduce. And the same thing with man. Those who can be reproductive, God blesses. Living beings that have a mind, a brain, and can function beyond the plants and beyond the the, the fish and, and so forth in the sea. And, and so God has made man in a special way, like other living creatures. He's blessed them. He has given them special life within. Bless, rest as living and life-giving. He blesses a segment of rest as if it were a living thing that gives life. Again, Exodus chapter 31, verse 17 says, it is a sign, the Sabbath is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. If this is significant for God, how much more for man? That God has instilled in us this ability that when we stop, our bodies refresh us, rejuvenate just by stopping. You go to the doctor and you have the flu or something else and most of the time he tells you, well, go home and, and take maybe some medicine, maybe some aspirin, something for your cold, for your flu, and drink lots of water and then he says, rest. Because God has so made the human body and other creatures, if you stop and rest, the body heals itself. It's like this internal life-giving blessing that God has given, not only to man, but living creatures. And so he stopped and he blessed a day. In this day of rest, there are life-giving properties. This is a mystery, but we experience it every time we faithfully rest we are rejuvenated, not only by sleep, but pausing and letting our mind and our soul and our emotions rest as well. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. Rest refreshes and restores. If you want to be like God, therefore, you need to use rest to bless, to bless your work and to also bless your rest. Bless not only work, but see rest as a blessed thing. Sometimes we have an attitude, or I had this attitude, I should say, that, uh, you know, I have no time for rest. I'm to bless rest instead of, well, the opposite is these nagging thoughts uh, like not enough, not good enough. Do you have those sayings that go into your mind? You do something and you say, well, I did this, but it wasn't enough. I did that, but it wasn't good enough. Blessing rest and your work is putting an end to that and recognizing what you did do, what you did accomplish and saying, that is good, I bless it. No, it's what, not perfect, but I bless it. It's not good enough, it's not perfect, but it's better than otherwise thought. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 tells us, Finally, brothers, the Apostle Paul says, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Rest is a time to bless your work and the rest and to be, begin to develop good mental practices 
Think about what is true, noble, right, love, admirable, ex excellent, praiseworthy. Think about these things intentionally versus not enough, not good enough. A time to practice better thought patterns, a time of rest is good for us. Now this is most interesting that rest divine is holy. What is holy about rest? The time apart from work. Well, we look at many passages of Scripture and we find the word holy connected with rest. We find that God is holy. He says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore be holy because I am holy. God has ordered us to be holy. How are we going to be holy? Except that we enter into a chamber of rest called, uh, a chamber of time called rest, a capsule of time in which God says, this is holy. And here we have the commandment given to us one more time. And Lois, if you'll read that for me. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I think that um, this word really uh, grips me because we talk a lot about you know, in, in church or, or in Bible study or even in our daily lives, what is holy? How do I be holy? And God calls the Sabbath or calls our intimate time with Him something that is holy. And I think it just validates once again that need to be intimate with Him and to spend that quiet, extended quiet time with Him. That's holiness, especially when we ask that question, what is holiness? What does it mean to be holy? And quiet or Sabbath or ceasing, stopping, God calls holy. Interestingly enough, it's the first thing that God calls holy. A Jewish believer has written the following, the mythical mind would ex expect that after heaven and earth have been established, God would create a holy place a holy mountain or a holy spring, whereupon a sanctuary is to be established. Yet it seems as if to the Bible it is holiness of time, the Sabbath which comes first. God said, it is a day and I declare it, not just declare it, but I make it holy. James Montgomery Boyce has said the following, so God sets the Sabbath apart Sabbath day apart to teach us that we are to enter not only into His rest but also into His holiness. The two go together because holiness is the opposite of sin and sin is what makes us restless. Sin is what makes us restless. Again, Abraham Heschel says, the Sabbaths are our great cathedrals and our Holy of Holies is a shrine that neither the Romans nor the Germans were able to burn in history. The Jews have often been a nomadic people. They wandered in the wilderness, but even after that when they had their own land they've been scattered in several ways and several times. But God said, I give you a time capsule every week, a day, and in this day it is a holy time. If you're going to be holy, you must enter into a time of rest. I have made it holy. And if you're going to be transformed into my sanctified holy people, you're going to have to enter rest. Now this rest goes with you wherever you are, wherever you travel. I can have this holy time capsule in America, in Nigeria, in Russia, 
anywhere I go, anywhere you go, if you set aside a time of holy meeting with God, call it rest, a, sab a Sabbath unto Him, you enter into that time, it is a place, it is a time of holiness for you, and it transforms you gradually. It's back to the work of transformation that is so important. The first thing God made holy, declared holy, was not a place, not a rock, not a church, but time, a segment of time, which is so very, very important. So we need to plan our sanctuary of time, like a cathedral, cathedral of time that goes with us. When are we going to do it? And I want you as students, whether you are here in this classroom today, or you're somewhere out in another part of the world, I want you to pause and select a time in the next week. When am I going to enter this sanctuary of time called Sabbath? And then to find a place, just as there was land set aside for the people of Israel, where am I going to do this? Am I going to do it in a park? And am I going to do it in a car? Am I going to do it in the corner, a closet? Where am I going to do it to find a place? And then to take turns as well is very important. So select a time, when. Select a place, where. And take turns. Who is going to help me? Especially if I am a mother or father and have children, like this little child that is pictured here. Uh, and parents may say, it's your turn to take care of this child. But rather, if you take turns, uh, the father says, uh, dear wife, you may go and have your Sabbath time, enter into that holy time. I'm going to watch the child or the children while you're doing that. And she says to him, okay, now it's your turn. When in the week are you going to do that if you have young children? And it's a big challenge. The hardest is for those who are single moms or single dads those who don't have uh, a wife or a husband to share the burden of raising children. Then you need to find friends, people in the church. Will you watch my children? Will I have my time with God? We get child care and we ask others to help us when we shop, when we do other things. How about understanding that rest is so important? It's so important that I enter into this time capsule of holiness with God to change me, to make me a better father, a better mother, a better wife or husband, whatever our roles may be, a better worker. Uh, it has got to be such a priority, a core value with us, that we're apt to make great sacrifices to be alone with God and enter very intentionally this time with God that changes us and pleases God. And we there bring closure we bless our work and we see that rest is a holy, holy thing.